Uh, for everybody, uh, just in case, uh, I'm not really going to be using the sharing screen option from Zoom, I'll just so you'll just be seeing my camera feed uh, in case you need to pin the, uh, the video uh, to make this work. So thank you ever so much. And uh, today I uh, have a little bit of a tongue in cheek presentation for you that is titled The 12 Ways to Fool the Masses with irreproducible results. Of course, uh, most of you will be familiar with the original, which was David, David Bailey's original 12 ways to fool the masses when giving uh, performance results on parallel computers. Uh, this was an instant classic, uh, but it was 30 years ago. Can you believe it? Uh, this is a time when uh, supercomputers um, you know, the debate was whether the superior kind was the two oxen cray machines or versus the thousand chickens systems. Um, we didn't have parallel standards like NPI. Um, there wasn't even a top 500 list at the time, but everyone was excited about the potential of these new parallel systems and each vendor claimed that their system was the best, showing sometimes cherry picked demos, uh, standard, benchmarks were not yet a thing, so it was like the Wild West. Now David Bailey collected his pick, his chosen schemes for presenting results to artificially boost performance claims. Uh, he and others presented, presented updates on this uh, list of tricks, and notably uh, was George Hager's series of blog posts that started in 2020, 2010. Uh, he discussed 16 such items, such he called them stunts. And this material really on his blog post could make an excellent compliment to any journal club on high performance computing. And it's highly recommended for all graduate students who after all are who keep us honest. So Scott, Scott Packen uh, also, uh, who I had the pleasure to work with uh, in the SC19 executive committee, wrote a new take on what he called the scientifically dubious techniques to artificially inflate the performance benefit of GPUs. Uh, at the time, 2011, if you recall, this was a time when some marketing teams of the top vendors were really going at each other. And um, surprisingly, some of David's um, uh, ways to fool the masses were relevant even two decades later, starting with the first one, which highlighted how uh, GPUs, uh, GPU results were often silently run with single precision to claim double the performance numbers. So in this talk, I want to take a new twist on the ways to fool the masses, focusing on how researchers, researchers in computational science and high performance computing miss the mark, let's say, when conducting or reporting their results with poor reproducibility. So let's get started. Uh, with these new ways to fold the masses. And the first one, my uh, first favorite one is data or code available upon request. Um, you may know that initiatives uh, to require authors to submit data with their manuscript really are decades old. Uh, there's a classic, the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking. Um, they launched an NSF supported project in 1982 which targeted data storage and evaluation. The journal adopted an editorial policy, quite stringent a, a policy to request from authors that code and data used in their manuscripts um, were made available and, uh, uh, to, the, to the journal, and then the journal could make it available to other researchers when they requested it. And an article um, here uh, screenshotted uh, reported on, the, on this project and it reads, um, somewhere, the existence of a requirement that authors submit to the journal their programs and data along with each manuscript would significantly reduce the frequency and magnitude of errors. We found uh, in their um, NSF funded study that the very process of authors compiling their programs and data for submission reveals to them ambiguities, errors, and oversights which otherwise would be undetected. The article also notes that authors who did not prepare for this requirement often found after the fact that they could not locate their data or code. Maybe the graduate student uh, left and they couldn't find it, 
or that they were lacking in the contemporaneous record of the research process and could not retrace their steps. In other words, leaving the data or code preparation for a later time of request is too late. These authors also point out that the NSF policy, uh, going way back when, I took this screenshot from a Google um, scan um, from 1978. Uh, so they, the authors did point out that there's a policy number 754.2, in fact, that requires data and software produced with the assistance of NSF grants to be made available to other researchers either by publication or on request by duplication or loan. You know, this at the time would have been tapes. Um, but in fact, this policy is not enforced. It wasn't even at the time, probably isn't very much today, or the, although that is changing. And researchers are either unaware of it um, or unconcerned with a failure to comply. So many journals have transitioned to um, policies of making data available upon request. Two additional requirements might maybe like requiring uh, a data availability statement or mandating um, the deposit of data and even peer review of the data and, and code. Um, and a factor of this trend is the growing availability of infrastructure. Uh, for data sharing. And maybe another factor is the recognition that authors frequently ignore such requests or even deny access. One empirical study um, uh, looked at the authors, they tested the author's responses to such requests. Um, and they found from about 200 articles that were published in Science that only 44% of the requests did lead to receiving some data and code, maybe not all of it, some from the original authors. And another uh, study uh, assessed the ability to recover data from researchers that were subject to a funder imposed data publication requirement. And they found that they could recover data in just 26% of cases. And in half of the failures, the reason was a loss of contact with the original data creator. The graduate student left. <laughs> so the authors conclude that funding agencies might uh, need to dedicate resources to enforcing compliance with data requirements, providing data sharing infrastructure, and possibly technical support to the awardees. Um, the fact is that despite some drift in data sharing policies, policies uh, once researchers receive the funding, or publish their papers, they um, have uh, little to no incentive to comply. The um, supercomputing, uh, the SC conference uh, series has been incrementally expanding an initiative to encourage reproducibility. And in 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, uh, made mandatory the inclusion of an artifact description appendix. That year, I was the SC Reproducibility Chair, and we introduced an open peer review process for supporting authors in the submission of um, and, and revision of their appendices. Authors were not required to share their code and data, but they would need to explicitly describe what was available and where, and what is not available. And uh, they were also guided to describe their experimental setup with a, you know, standard template that would have granular questions about hardware details, OS, compiler, application, uh, libraries, key algorithms, and data sets and things like that. So with granular questions, then um, the authors would be better guided to produce this uh, appendix. Now for artifacts that were made available, the authors were guided to use proper archival quality services, providing a DOI and uh, to use appropriate standard public licenses. For SC20, uh, a community sentiment survey sought to assess the impact of this initiative and uh, on the community and a majority of respondents who were th went through the process uh, did say that they now think differently about theirs and others research after going through the process and a good portion of them said that they actually have used the appendices that um, were published by others. So that was my first um, uh, case. Uh, the second is a classic one, uh, report speed up, but do not report base performance. 
And the speed up is, uh, is, is by, by some accounts, uh, the most misused metric in the, computa in the computing field. Uh, it's subdivision simple. Runtime with n processes divided by runtime with one process. That's parallel speed up. Or maybe the variant runtime with the new method divided by runtime with the old method. But always the devil is in the denominator. What is the best serial execution? Was it a single parallel process? What was the absolute performance? Torsten Hofler in his keynote at Benchmarking 20 had a slide uh, calling it the very common and oldest known issue. And George Hager lists this as his stunt number one, while his stunt number two is about slowing down the computation to lower the impact of overheads, thereby boosting speed up, fiddling with the denominator. Um, Hofler and uh, Belly in their SC15 paper um, um, go so far as saying a speed up is often meaningless. Uh, it will be higher on slow processors or less optimized code. So they say, while speed up can be used as a dimensionless metric for the scaling of a single algorithm on a single computer, it cannot be used to compare different algorithms or different computers, which is what we see all the time. And <laughs> the latest culprits um, in this exploit uh, our machine learning researchers who demonstrate that their neural network model maybe can match solutions to traditional mathematical physical models. In uh, ML, the term baseline model is often used, but you know, it originally it refers to a simple approach like a logistic regression or even a heuristic in comparison to which a more complex model, maybe a deep neural network, uh, offers improvement. But talking about baseline when comparing with a well-established method in another field is often quite unhelpful because it leaves open the scenario where this baseline is a naive or even deprecated simple model, which experts quickly um, disagree with. So if they report speed as over this baseline, they will be pushed back. So don't compare your novel model with a weak baseline. A good baseline should be the most popular or best expertly used method. How does this relate to reproducibility? Well, if you do fully transparent reporting, uh, would you would include every relevant detail of the experiments, including all the factors that go into the denominator of any speed up metric. This is level zero of reproducibility, presenting the data and analysis with sufficient transparency and clarity that the results can be checked. When doing so, failings in the experimental design are also revealed. Do the data support the claims? That is the question. Number three, only publish, as in make public, the results of successful trials. Uh, this is a classic question of publication bias, where only work with positive results ends up recorded in the scholarly literature. This has been recognized as a problem for decades. Meta-researchers call this the file drawer problem because it has been found that the main reason for this bias is that investigators choose to submit for publication only the good stuff, only the positive results. Never mind that some editors uh, would also use uh, these, this criterion for choosing to review a paper. So this, this was particularly affecting the um, clinical research and empirical sciences that use null hypothesis statistical testing. But computer science is not immune. A recent review article in the communications of the ACM found several areas of computer science, including performance analysis, software engineering, and human-computer interaction, which use this type of hypothesis testing and are subject to publication bias. More simply, the reward structure is such that we, all of us, are constantly chasing successful results and we fail to even properly document avenues explored, dead ends, or failures. And at the end of the spectrum of misleading practices, running a code experiment multiple times and only reporting the best outcome in your paper, well, uh, uh, <laughs> researcher-led <laughs> publication bias. Number four, report that you used an external library such as a linear solver, Petsy, Trulinos, AMGX, but don't document the version. 
Also omit the options you used, any options like preconditioners which you entered interactively on the command line. Um, domain, uh, domain scientists um, uh, should not be writing their own linear solvers, of course. We have many libraries for those purposes and beyond. Pets, Trilinos are examples. Um, now, for some applications, the different versions of an external library can lead to uh, a code giving different results. We experienced this, and this is a screenshot of our paper uh, with our CFD application using the CUSP linear algebra uh, library for CUDA devices. We found that two versions led to differences in the solution. We actually had to use the bisection method on the revision history of the code to be able to pinpoint the issue that was a refactoring of the smooth aggregation preconditioning in the uh, algebraic multigrid solver. And David Bailey also often quotes an example from uh, analysis of uh, uh, collisions in the LHC. And they found that changing an underlying math library resulted in some collisions being missed or misidentified. So computational science articles often do mention the library used as a dependency. They might include the reference um, in the references list, um, maybe a user manual or the main article uh, about uh, that art library, but seldom document the version of the library that was used to generate the results. Well, you know that you could be using Docker or Singularity to provide software build recipes with all the dependencies, but this is too much work somehow. Um, so in fact, there's one more reason, more than one reason to document uh, your complete software environment programmatically using Docker or Singularity, uh, because on top of preserving a complete um, software recipe, um, you facilitate any interested reader's ability to install that stack, avoiding so-called dependency hell. Um, so um, uh, this is a, the typical situation that uh, arises also is that you have command line arguments and those command line arguments um, can be entered, uh, you know, should be saved uh, properly. Otherwise they are completely lost in the shell history and reproducible research requires that you script all these execution calls and preserve in text files, all the options and parameters, ideally also under version control. So next one, to showcase your parallel framework um, or your new machine, great machine, take a simple problem and scale it to a large system without checking if the application may be saturated in accuracy at a medium scale and the rest is just heating up the atmosphere. Um, say your demo is a, a partial differential equation um, in two dimensions and the solution method is a traditional finite difference scheme. A computational scientist's first step in the situation would be to do solution verification by refining the computational grid twice to get three increasingly more accurate solutions. Then you can you know, compute the observed order of convergence and check that it matches the theoretical order. If it, doesn't, if it does not, then you have a bug in the code. And, um, uh, or maybe the grids are still too coarse and they're not in the asymptotic region. And one can also use this method to compute how much the solution would change with a further refinement of the computational grid. And you can estimate the grid's resolution required to obtain a desired level of accuracy. Needless to say, if the computations are carried out in IEEE 64-bit floating point arithmetic, any refinements of the grid beyond the scale that gives that level of accuracy is just heating up the atmosphere. It's unwarranted. Um, or maybe it could make things worse because indeed uh, scaling up applications has consequences on the accumulation of error. So we should always confirm that they still reflect empirical reality. This is from the ISRM report in 2012, um, where they point out um, that numerical round of error and numerical differences are greatly magnified as computational simulations are scaled up to run on highly parallel systems. So when from a meaningful applications point of view, more precision would be needed as you scale up the problem, 
that should also be reflected on how we transparently report performance. In other words, when scaling up an application, check the point when more precision is needed and turn it on for larger runs, uh, even if that means more pressure on the memory bandwidth or slower arithmetic operations. It's always this trade-off, right? Uh, in fact, in some applications, in some areas, some domains, uh, people use double-double uh, for some of these reasons. So next one. Uh, based with a small change, this is contributed as an anti-pattern contributed by Mike Carew. Faced with a small change in floating point results of the test, say a difference with a golden file or a trigger of a threshold failure uh, for a residual test, instead of looking for the source of that change, replace the golden file or relax the tolerance to make the test pass. Um, as mentioned in the previous scenario, numerical precision becomes even more important at large scales. In some areas of science, teams use uh, this idea of golden master testing. And so they have golden files or a reference expected output against which the results of the code are compared after any refactoring or changes. So this is, this is really a common practice when dealing with the legacy code. And this form of testing depends on strict numerical reproducibility. If the, the test will not pass, if the situation changes with respect to floating point error, for example, after scaling up the computations. So if the team has chosen this form of testing, they should stick to it. If the tests fail, investigate the cause. In fact, sometimes the careful investigation of these vexing numerical variations can lead to valuable improvements. An example from a climate model modeling, here's a citation, He and Ding, 2001. They discovered that they could improve the numerical stability of the simulations and ensure reproducibility by using double-double precision in just two key inner loops and using Kahan summation. Um, so this is also a recommended reading. Next one. When observing non-deterministic measurements, report a simple summary statistic like the average without giving a measure of variance or computing confident intervals much less testing for normality. <laughs> um, a single summary statistic can be used for deterministic data, such as the number of floating point operations. Execution times are rarely deterministic. Uh, this paper by Hof, uh, Hofler and Belly uh, at SC15 gives an example. Suppose that you made 50 runs of the uh, HPL benchmark on 60 nodes of your center's big machine, and they show a wide variation of run times. So they, this is the plot that they show in, in their paper as an example. And they say, well, you know, you can see there that if you reported the minimum run time, well, obviously that would be misleading. So you report the average instead. Well, that sounds fair, but this obscures the fact that variability exists. Uh, on their literature review, Hofler and Belly uh, in this paper report that they found that um, most papers that they looked at reported non-deterministic data, um, but only 2% more or less reported confidence intervals around the mean. In that case, they didn't go so far as to test for normality. So in reporting a measure of central tendency like the mean or the medium, we should be careful that they represent the results well. One might want to show the distribution like in this plot or give um, several stats, max, min, median, percentiles. But the key is providing the underlying data and the analysis code in an archival repository. Then, uh, uh, it can always be checked. And also shifting the focus to the distribution of measurements rather than a simple summary statistics is, is good for reproducibility because now the assessment that we make, whether the results are consistent, uh, can refer to an appropriately fuzzy target, not you know just one number that you're never going to match. So the next one. Report your performance benchmark describing the machine simply in terms of the number and the model of the processors. 
uh, nodes or accelerators. And we all just want to know how many and what brand of hardware you use, right? Well, not so fast. <laughs> when um, performance is key to the findings in a paper, these details, many details matter. The network topology of the HPC cluster, for example, can have a major impact on the um, distributed computing performance. This is uh, George Hag Hager's stunt number six. So you should describe all details in the cluster architecture, the file system, whether it was had a dedicated data node, the IO auxiliary system, so on. Um, sometimes the set of nodes that the scheduler, send, the, the scheduler um, sends your run to affects the runtime. Check the last item. If you have um, non-deterministic results, you should report that. I mean, you know, there could be to, you. You all know, you know, you send the run, and it, you know, it ends up in nodes that are in a different um, switch or portion of the network, and things change, uh, affect runtime. So you should include this variation in your reports, and similarly usage conditions of the cluster. For example, if the, you run your exam, uh, uh, simulations in a quiet machine or you had simultaneous users, that can affect performance. Now, you may think that the job scheduler is assigning you to a dedicated node for your run, but this could be false because some users somehow always find some back doors to the schedulers or these have, they have bugs as well. Um, plenty of times we find those situations, don't we? Next one. Cite some technical out of your control reason for any lackluster or non-deterministic results. This is George Hager's stunt number 13, the mysterious reasons that you can give for any unexplained discrepancies that include compilers optimization capabilities, prefetching, out of order execution, any other hardware features, unexplained cache misses, or even the, the, the kicker, bank conflicts, OS noise and jitter. So don't attempt to confirm and you know really explain the observation, just name something that is completely misunderstood by your readers and they will um, plow through. With a long list of these obscure reasons, um, you can speculatively cite for behavior that you cannot explain. The results are going to be harder to interpret and impossible to reproduce. Next one, showcase your deep learning model's impressive speed up compared with a traditional model, but only count the time for the forward evaluation of the network. No need to report training time or the cost of generating the training data. That's offline after all. The explosion of interest in machine learning and science uh, is like the wild west of supercomputing all over again um, from the Bailey's original ways to full. Uh, one pattern that we see more and more is to report speedups. See George Hager's stunt number one. And comparing the forward evaluation of a neural network model with a traditional model, say a finite difference solution to a partial differential equation. Now these articles nearly always, always <laughs> neglect to report the time it took to train the network. Um, they may have the reasons, probably they did not consult with that computational scientist. Now forget about all the extra time used to tune hyperparameters, that's absolutely um, no need to report that. Now, sometimes the training data was generated by running the traditional model a hundred and hundreds of times, and this is also glossed over. So this practice really compounds several um, things. There's more than one way to fool the masses here. First, the use of speed up to compare two different models is highly prob problematic. Um, the poor reporting really makes the results impossible to fully interpret or reproduce. This idea of the baseline as a naive or even obsolete algorithm. And finally, the limitations of the learned model are sometimes ignored or even not discussed. Uh, forget that it doesn't work if you change the boundary conditions or things like that. Next one, put the code on GitHub the week before submitting the manuscript or presenting at the conference. You share your code, that's great, but several things can go wrong with this pattern. Uh, the zero order uh, is, um, if you're putting the code on GitHub just to satisfy requirements of the journal or conference, but you are not developing in the open model, 
then you probably don't have the full version history of the code that allows you to know exactly what version produced the results. And you're also not benefiting from the quality assurance process that teams adopt alongside with open development, the use of branching models, issue tracking, review of pull requests. Um, second, in this pattern, it is likely that you are including in your paper the URL to the GitHub repository as evidence of code availability. But this is not enough. Anyone can delete, well, the owners, of course, can delete their GitHub repositories later on. So the only way to prove that the software will be persistently available is to make a full deposit in an archival quality service like Zenodo. Uh, this is easy with the Zenodo GitHub integration right now. So good practice is to issue a tagged release on GitHub with the version used to generate the results presented in the paper, archive that release on Zenodo, and list the archive DOI in the paper. Bonus points for submitting the software to the Journal of Open Source Software. Uh, if you haven't yet looked into that, JOS, the Journal of Open Source Software, uh, will carry out peer review on the software. And uh, oftentimes it will lead to higher quality software for research. So that leads us to my last one for today, which is the same as Bailey's 12th way. Uh, include lots of pretty pictures in your paper, but not the scripts that generated them. This is, uh, as I said, Bailey's 12th way. And it's also related to Hager's stunt number 11. He says, uh, five pages of busy bar graphs will go a long way to the 10 page limit. And um, so question for the audience, have you ever found yourself digitizing a plot from a published paper? Like literally using mouse clicks to try to digitize um, uh, plots. Uh, I, if I had a poll, I would be interested in the results. The I we've done it many many times, and that is because people are not um, publishing with the figures the underlying secondary data behind every point in that figure and the scripts that generated the figures. So, with that uh, final ways to fool the masses, I just wanted to share with you some uh, what the a reproducibility checklist that we have in our group. This applies for computational science. Maybe it doesn't apply to all of you, but uh, if you do computational science like we do, I hope that you will be inspired. This is our standard. Um, all code and application is developed under version control, uh, under a version control system, we use Git. All code and applications are developed in the open on GitHub. Um, the code and application relies only on open source dependencies. The code repository contains detailed installation instructions and user-facing documentation. The computational environment is programmatically captured in Docker files or a Docker image. Uh, files to recreate the image uh, of the computational environment are shared on a public repository as well. The image of the environment is shared on a public registry like Docker Hub. Even Zenodo will take your images. Um, optional number eight uh, is if the machine disallows Docker, which often happens in shared systems, of course, because they need root, uh, Docker wants root access, then you can instead consider using the Singularity container technology because Singularity also understands Docker images. And so um, um, everything works. Number nine is a bonus as well to use a cloud service to submit and run the simulations. In this case, uh, we have a paper where we extend the idea of reproducibility to um, um, scripted and um, uh, definitions of the cloud environment and um, share those as well as uh, files that can be inspected and reused by any interested reader. Number 10, simulation inputs and parameters are documented in text files that are shared on public repositories. Number 11, the code repository is release, released, as I mentioned earlier, and uploaded to Zenodo to get a DOI that you can cite in your paper. Uh, this release should be the tagged release um, corresponding to the results that you report in the paper. 
Um, well, that's number 12, a tagged release uh, with the results in the manuscript. Number 13 is we also are writing all our manuscripts in the version control system. So in our GitHub group, GitHub, um, you'll find our LaTeX uh, uh, asset develops. And our bonus um, is to do that in the open. So it's not a private repository, it's actually um, public. And um, number 15, the manuscript reports the hardware and machines used for the computational simulations in all its gory details. Number 16, the figures included in the manuscript can be regenerated. Uh, the plot and scripts and all the necessary secondary data are shared on our repository and easily downloadable, downloadable by any interested party. And we deposit our figures uh, also on Fixture to get a DOI for the figure. And this is a trick we've been using for quite a while. It's very useful. You can get for your many important results in your paper a, um, a figure that you uh, published under a CC BY license. And then you cite the DOI in the paper. And uh, that means that when you transfer copyright of the paper, the figure stays uh, reusable under the original CC BY license. Uh, I did this quietly for five years before actually asking the university lawyer. <laughs> um, number 18 is uh, to upload always your preprint um, to archive or similar service. And the bonus, we've been doing this for a while now. Uh, we use the issue tracker on GitHub to keep track of our the comments from the reviewers, the peer reviewers, and the replies to them. Um, we handle that in the open. So that was uh, the bonus slides to share with you. And I always tell my students that uh, the best thing that you can do for an audience is to finish early. So I've achieved that today and left some time for um, Q&A if you're so interested. And thank you ever so much for showing up today. Uh, online talks are not exactly the same, but we do what we can. Thank you. <laughs>